team up with Jesus in a world that fired their worst at him, he says, expect to be caught in the crossfire too. As we stand, let's pray. Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. Lord God, we do pray that you would speak to each one of us here tonight. Give us ears to hear and hearts to obey. For Jesus' sake, amen. Do please sit down. And if you've got a Bible, you might want to turn to Luke chapter 14, where we are this evening, or page 874 in the church Bibles. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Well, that's certainly one way of gaining recruits. Can you imagine Jose Marina touting for a job in the Premier League? Unless you hate your family, I don't want your support. It's not an obvious opening gambit, is it? Maybe you're watching Dragon's Den on the TV, budding entrepreneurs making their pitch. Morning, Dragons. Unless you hate your company, hate yourself, and give everything away, I'm not interested in your investment. I doubt they teach you that on your MBA. In fact, if we were to think about it, if you were to put on a guest service at a church, and you were to invite your friends along to come and check out the Christian message, surely the last thing you'd do with such, frankly, embarrassing small print (laughs) in the Bible, is to headline them for all at the top of the page. Really, short of having this talk on Mother's Day in a few weeks' time, unless you hate your mother, you can't be my disciple. Maybe you do that another year, folks. Uh, What kind of crazy church is this, you think? Are we trying to accelerate the um, sinking UK church statistics we're told about? Well, let me be perfectly clear. I'm not trying to do that. And in fact, I'm praying that the talk tonight will convince some of you to become a Christian or at least move you on the road towards faith in Christ and giving Jesus the serious thought he demands. Because Jesus is so intriguing, isn't he? In fact, it's passages like the one we're looking at this evening that convince me more and more that Luke's gospel isn't just a collection of myths or exaggerations or wish fulfillments that the skeptics often throw at it. If you and a bunch of friends were down the pub and were trying to rustle up a religion for people to fall for, there is no way at all you would include this passage, is there? Out with the embarrassing small print, the invasive Jesus, the Jesus who's taking himself just a little too seriously No one's going to buy that. And yet, of course, this passage does make the final cut of Luke's gospel. And I think, therefore, it has the ring of authenticity about it. If Luke can be trusted on the hard bits, the bits you'd easily axe, well, surely we'd want to trust him on everything else. Well, anyway, back to our passage and these extraordinary words of Jesus. What are we to make of them? I have two very simple points to make this evening. Here's our first point. Jesus is completely worth following. Jesus is completely worth following. Now, the concept of uh, following someone has taken a surprising turn in the last couple of years. The idea a few years ago that you or I might follow Justin Bieber or Lady Gaga or Stephen Fry even would have just sounded odd. But now, for example, over five million of us In the UK, follow Stephen Fry on Twitter. 
Now, if you're interested, Justin Bieber has uh, um, over 34 million followers. Lady Gaga just behind him. They're the global top two uh, users, most popular ones of Twitter. Now, um, I have to say, for the uninitiated, by follow, I mean have clicked on a website um, a button. And now everything that that celebrity or friend or friend who thinks they're a celebrity thinks is important, <laughs> everything they say or tweet, well, that comes into your computer to read. It's very deep, I know. Um, <laughs> following your hero is just one click away. Well, once upon a time, the word follow actually meant something. Um, I guess in, in a similar way that once upon a time in the ancient days, the medieval period before Facebook, the word friend meant something. Anyway, um, the, um, in those old-fashioned days of your era, the old-fashioned meaning of the word follow was to pursue or to go after someone wherever they led. And it's that meaning that we're talking about here. And Jesus is completely worth following. Now, this point actually doesn't um, spring out of our passage directly, but it's kind of assumed in the passage from the context surrounding it, and we need to get that clear before we move on. Because there's nothing worse than being taken out of context or quoted out of context. I don't know if that's ever happened to you. So say you're at McDonald's and you overhear a dad on the phone, and he says, I wish my son was more messy. And all the while, the kids are throwing chips at each other and squirting each other with tomato sauce. You think, more messy, eh? I think they're doing pretty well, friend. And then you realise he's actually talking about the school first 11 football trials. And I wish my son was more messy. Well, every dad wants their son to be more messy. I'd love my son to be more messy, more Lionel Messi, the Barcelona Argentinian wonder kid. But you take the quote out of context, it makes no sense. And the context for Luke 14 is crucial. The big story context is Jesus is on a journey. He's going from his hometown of Galilee, home region of Galilee in the north, chapter 9, and all the way through the next 10 chapters down to chapter 19, he's traveling south down to Jerusalem. And on his journey, he's meeting people and he's telling stories and they're Well, the Bible word is parables, and the stories are to do with what it means to follow Jesus. And uh, he's getting quite a following, so in verse 25 of our passage, you'll see, now great crowds accompanied Jesus. There's a great train of interest surrounding this man. Understandably, curiosity has been raised. He's recently healed someone. But it seems that it's his teaching that is so unmistakably compelling. If you were to look over to the next chapter, chapter 15, verse 1, uh, you'll see, now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to hear Jesus. These are people who wouldn't normally associate with a religious leader, but they're all crowding in, desperate to hear what this man has to say. And what he's saying is that God loves to throw a great party. In the middle of chapter 14, 15 to 23, is the parable of the great banquet. There, we've got a man who clearly represents God in the story, who throws this great, great party, invites loads of people, excuses are made, and so the host, what does he do? He goes out after the waste and the strays and drags them in to celebrate with him. In chapter 15, we've got three stories of loss, lost sheep, lost coin, lost son. And in each case, you'll see that as the sheep, the coin, the son are found, again, there's great celebration. The friends are invited round, the barbecue is fired up, the beers flow, the dancing goes on into the night. But if you're honest, God and parties, they don't often go in the same sentence for most of us, do they? Jesus, if he's anyone, he's the kind of guy who turns wine into water. He takes you to McDonald's and makes you order a McFla- uh, McSalad. Oh, he, um, he, he wants to tie you up in his thou shalt not and ruin your life. But friends, Jesus is not like that at all. Jesus came to turn water into wine. He came to bring life in all its fullness. Ultimately, we see if we read on in Luke's gospel, he came to rescue people from hell, yes, 
for heaven. And the way he does that is he dies on the cross for us, in our place. That's where his journey's heading. He offers us free forgiveness and acceptance with God. And so when we get to verse 25 of our passage and there's a large crowd gathering around him, it's no surprise because Jesus is completely worth following. That's the first point tonight. And it set the scene, the context is in place for now our controversial teaching. If point one, Jesus is completely worth following. Secondly, Jesus must be followed completely. Jesus must be followed completely. Look down again to verse 25. Now, great crowds accompanied Jesus. I imagine there would have been a whole load of curious people in that mix. Give us a story, Jesus. Give us a miracle, Jesus. But Jesus doesn't really want to make people just curious or mere spectators. He's not, he's not interested in the number of followers he's got on Twitter. Yeah, I'll have a bit of Jesus, thanks, click. No, he's not interested in that. He wants good, old-fashioned, Monday through Saturday, Sunday disciples, everyday disciples. He wants people who will step over into the circle of personal faith and commitment. That's what he wants. And he says that the act of stepping over into the circle of personal faith and commitment will cost you everything. It's got to cost you everything. It's not simply a case of giving up Haribo or Pringles for Lent, if that's what you're up to. I guess it's a bit of a relief. It's actually much, much more than that. Three times we read in verses 26 to 33, where we're going up to tonight, Jesus uses the same phrase, unless you do X or Y or Z, you cannot be my disciple. And it's here that we get the H-bomb dropped. So let's just go for the juggler. Here we are, verse 25. Jesus said, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. What can he be meaning? Well, for starters, let's be clear, and you knew I was going to say this, hate can't actually mean hate. Let me see what I mean. Four chapters earlier in Luke 10, Jesus famously calls his disciples, very famously, to love your neighbour as yourself, as one of your church verses runs. In Luke 6, he even tells us to love our enemies. And in the next chapter, very soon after um, this little exchange at the end of Luke 14, Luke 15, Jesus gives the illustration of a loving father whose prodigal son returns home and He runs out to meet his son and he hugs him and he kisses him and he knocks him to the floor in love. And that's not the most obvious way to show that you hate someone. Unless you're squeezing them really, really, really hard, I guess. And I love you, I love you, I love you, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. No, that's not the point. But if hate doesn't mean hate, well, what does it mean? What we're going to do is have a quick look at the Old Testament. And the same word that is translated hate here in our New Testament is in the Old Testament. I've put it up on the screen. It's from Genesis chapter 29. The context is Jacob, the father of Joseph and his Technicolor dream coat fame. And, um, and he, like a number of ancient characters, has two wives, Rachel and Leah. Uh, Genesis 29 verse 30. Jacob made love to Rachel. And his love for Rachel was greater than his love for Leah. Verse 31. When the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb. But Rachel was barren. Do you see it there? Then two verses. Leah, verse 30, is loved. Verse 31, she's hated. The Bible word hate often has the sense of loves less than. Jacob loves Leah less than he loves Rachel, which in verse 31 is described as Jacob hates Leah. And we think, that's a bit strong, Jacob, but Jacob says, no, no, it's a comparative word. My love for Rachel is so great, massive in comparison with my love for Leah, that it makes my love for Leah look like hate. 
Let's look back in Luke uh, 14, when Jesus, he's not saying literally hate your family, hate yourself, or you can't follow me. He's saying to put him first. That's the point of our first reading from Deuteronomy chapter 6. We're to put him first. Jesus is saying that love for family, especially in the first century context, where family is absolutely everything, like in many other cultures around the world today, and unlike our kind of individualised or atomised West, whether that's a love for your parents or your spouse, fiancé, girlfriend, boyfriend, sibling, even love for yourself, when that love stands next to love for Jesus, it's to be so utterly dwarfed, so on different scales, that family love will actually look like the opposite. It'll look like hate. See, Jesus is looking for followers who will put his desires and concerns ahead of expectations of our mum or our dad or what our girlfriend or our boyfriend say, ahead even of what you yourself would naturally choose to do and to be. We're to put him first. Which means being ready to take the hit. That's the heart of Jesus' second challenge of discipleship. Whoever, verse 27, does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. The English language has adopted talk of having a cross to bear as a metaphor for any slight inconvenience, hasn't it? So if you're short-sighted or you're lactose intolerant or you're not very good at catching a ball, well, we've all got our cross to bear, I suppose. In the first century, there was nothing trivial about bearing your cross. Convicted criminals were made to carry their crosses on the walk of shame and abuse and terror out to the hill where they'd be crucified on the cross they just carried. So for bearing your cross, you may as well read, load the guns for the firing squad, wire up your electric chair. Friends, I need to be as honest as Jesus was. If you team up with Jesus in a world that fired their worst at him, he says, expect to be caught in the crossfire too. It might come from those near you, close family or friends. They don't get you anymore. Behind your back, they smile and snigger and smirk. Maybe it comes from those a bit further away from you, lecturers or the media, who kind of give the impression that if thinking goes up, then surely faith goes down. Which means if your faith is going up, then you're losing it in your head. For many people around the world and throughout history, it's meant a lot worse. Following Jesus means putting him first. You take the hit and you give your all. That's in verses 28 to 33. And here Jesus gives us two illustrations. We don't have time to, to work through it in detail. Verses 28 to 30 is about building you get halfway through a loft extension or building a great big skyscraper in the city of London. If you haven't got the money to put the roof on and there's a snowstorm on its way, that is not cool at all. Or verses 31 to 32 are about wartime. You don't get into a battle if you haven't worked out your strategy first. Can we go all out for a victory? Do we go the diplomacy route? In both instances, you plan first and you count the cost. And the summary verse is there in verse 33, if you want to look down. Therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Being a lifelong follower of Jesus is like the builder who gives up his money. He's like the king who gives up his time, his planning. It's like the professional sportsman we heard about earlier, putting in hour after hour after hour of brutal training, early mornings, in the dark, in the wet, the cold. It means giving up your plans and dreams, the schemes, your money, your all for the greater prize. Handing it over to Jesus and allowing his perfect and loving agenda and priorities to take control. For Jesus must be followed completely. 
Let's try and wrap things up. It's been a very strange sales pitch from Jesus, hasn't it? Roll up, roll up, come and die with me. Why is he saying it? Can't he settle for more of a Twitter-like following? Yes, I'll click follow Jesus, I'll follow him like I'll follow anyone else. Why does he have to be so demanding? I think the answer is because he wants to save us. He knows, you see, that naturally the good things around us that we love, be that work or family or relationships or sex, money, they're all good things given to us by God. But when any of them becomes our first love, our supreme love, we're looking for them for salvation. But they enslave us. Chris Evert was one of the world's best tennis players in the 70s and 80s. But she was petrified at facing retirement. She admitted, and I quote, I have no idea who I was or what I, had, what I could be away from tennis. I was depressed and afraid because so much of my life had been defined by my being a tennis champion. I was completely lost. Winning made me feel like I was somebody. It made me feel pretty. I was like, it was like being hooked on a drug. I needed the wins, the applause, in order to have an identity. Tennis had become Chris Everts' functional salvation. But it enslaved her. Maybe for you, you have to have to have the clothing or the relationship or the likes on your Facebook status, the followers on Twitter, the recognition. Without them, you are doomed. They've become your functional salvation. But they'll enslave you. Yet when Jesus calls us to follow him completely, he says, I'm your salvation. I'm your freedom. As American writer Tim Keller says, Jesus is the only God who, if you get him, he'll satisfy you. But if you fail him, he'll still forgive you. And necessarily taking hold of Jesus as number one will mean relinquishing our hold of a parent as our first love. Or our child or our spouse, real or imaginary. Or our girlfriend or boyfriend, real or imaginary. Or work or sport, as Adam did. Or music or anything else as number one. It will mean ultimately letting go of yourself as number one in order to take hold of Jesus. And friends, the reason we'd want to do that, the reason we'd want to give up ourselves to follow Jesus completely is because as we saw at the start, Jesus is completely worth following. He loves us. He'll never fail us. He'll always, always forgive us. Because supremely, the one who calls us to give our all for him is the one who gave his all, who went to the cross, carried the cross for us. So friends, can I urge you this evening to turn around and make Jesus your first love? Let's have a moment of quiet and then I'll pray. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for your honesty. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for your salvation. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are completely worth following. You're a master who loves us, who wants the best for us, who went ahead and died on a cross to win us and rose again for us. We praise you, Lord Jesus. And we pray, Lord God, you would help us to respond to your call to follow you completely. Please help us to do that. Help us to take the risk, the challenge that that may be for us, to follow you. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.